The first thing to unbox is the frame. It comes with two side panels. The swing arm, which was surprisingly heavy. And the main body of the frame, which has a battery compartment inside. The frame also comes with a bag of hardware, a front cover, and a normal bicycle seat mount, which I will not be using. Now to unbox the motor kit. It comes with a display, the controller, and the brake discs, levers, and calipers. I went with blue rims, this dual sport tire for the street and off-road, and a 5T motor for more torque. I'm not going to buy the battery because they are very expensive. I'm going to make one out of these 18650 lithium ion cells. Here's all of my 18650s. Obviously I'm going to need a lot more. So I decided to buy this giant battery pack. This pack contains 444 18650 cells. Originally, it was in a Tesla Model S. To disassemble this pack, first I need to pull all these tiny fuses off of the cells. After I did that, I checked the voltage on the balance leads to make sure I didn't miss any fuses. After removing the fuses on the other side, I started peeling back the aluminum bus bars. Then I got to work pulling off the plastic that was holding the cells in place. I realized that if I used a Dremel to cut this aluminum section off the side, it would be a lot easier. It really seems like a lot more cells when they're spread out like this. Now the boring part starts. All the cells have epoxy left on the ends, and I found that the best way to remove it was just to scrape it off with the razor blade. This took about 24 hours for all the cells. At first I was planning on using 400 cells in this configuration, but there's no way I can make it fit. I ended up using 300 cells in this configuration. So I'm thinking about mounting the controller here, just like that on the front, like a Suron, and I already checked the front wheel. It'll have plenty of room, but the problem is there's, there's top mounts, but there's no bottom mounts, and that makes sense because battery's supposed to be there. You don't want bolts there, and so I was thinking I could take this front tray that I'm not going to be using and make it into some sort of mount there so I don't have to drill any holes. I don't know. I'll figure it out. Okay, I think I figured it out. I'll take the battery container type thing that I'm not going to use. It fits right there. Just like that. And then I took the cover off the back so that I can bolt it on. It should work great. Just like that. So I got the controller on. I got the wires hooked up, and it looks like the wire's barely going to be long enough to go around the battery. On the rear brakes, because I had some extra spacers in here, I had to use longer bolts with nuts to space this out to match up to the brake disc, which that's expected. If I did something different, then I should have to modify it. But for some reason, this caliper was way too far out. It wasn't even, it was only hitting like half the brake rotor, so I had to grind it a bunch. Then also grind in here too, and all this stuff, and I just can't get it to work good. Right now it's on the whole disc, but some of these tips of the brake rotor are still hitting there. And it's still like rubbing a pad no matter what I do, moving this back and forth and doing the like brake lever method. So I'm just going to call it good. I got it mostly assembled. I put the 2 kilowatt 48 volt battery from my old e-bike in there and everything seems to be working so 
So now I'm just waiting for the front wheel and I can do a test ride. All right, here's the first test ride on mode one. No, oh, that's not very fast. I'm gonna turn that all the way up. <laughs> Oh yeah, this would definitely f needs more power, but the frame's there, and the brake squeaks there also, that's annoying, but I just gotta break them in. The suspension is like perfect. I think I need to adjust the shocks maybe a little bit, because it's like bottoming out on the top a bunch, but... Yeah, I think this is going to work great. Definitely doesn't feel super heavy. I thought it would feel like heavy, but I think it's good. Back to the battery build. The BMS I bought for this battery turned out to be way bigger than I expected, so there's no good way for me to mount it to the battery. Whatever, I'll figure that out later. To divide the battery, I decided to take this plastic sheet from an old TV and cut it into sections. The middle section is taller because the positive and negative are right next to each other and I do not want them to touch. Most 18650 cells that you will see will be wrapped in plastic and then will have a little insulator ring on the end. That's because on these cells, the negative terminal starts here and it's the entire outer case of the shell all the way to right there. So if you have a cell like this, it's kind of dangerous because any metal could go right there and short the battery out. So if you want to make these cells less dangerous, you have to put a little insulator ring on the end and you have to either wrap it in shrink wrap like these cells or put some other insulator inside. So for this battery, I'm going to be using this capped on tape. This battery will have 20 cells in series, making it a 72 volt nominal battery, which is the standard for high power e-bikes. It will also have 15 cells in parallel, giving it 40 amp hours of capacity and 150 amps of maximum discharge current. Before spot welding, it's always a good idea to check the cell voltages to make sure there's no large voltage differences. First I spot welded the series connections. Then I spot welded the parallel connections and started wiring the balance leads. For the main battery connections I got these copper terminals. They fit perfectly on the controller and to make them fit this 3 gauge wire I just ground the tip of the wire down a bit. Once I squish it on there good and solder it, it should be a good connection. Here's the battery with everything spot welded together and the wires attached. I used some double sided tape to keep the plastic in place. After that I connected the BMS and the charger and made sure everything was charging correctly with all the cell groups getting the same voltage. I wrapped the battery and cushioned it with some foam and then finished it off with some tape. Before I installed the battery, I decided to cut off this stock kickstand mount. It was just way too low and it was going to hit everything. I used one of the pieces from the kickstand mount to weld a new mount further back on the swing arm. I also didn't like the look of this orange wire, so I used some heat shrink to cover it up. I also used a cable gland to make it more waterproof. At this point I realized the phase wires were not going to reach, so I had to extend them. I then cut off the stock controller mounts from the top of the frame so I could bolt the BMS up there. I then added some extra cushion and installed the battery. I had to take the cover off the BMS, but I managed to get everything to fit in there. It was a tight squeeze. To program the controller, you have to plug this USB stick into a little black wire coming out of the controller. However, that's really inconvenient as you would have to take the side panel off every time. So I decided I was going to put this female to female USB bulkhead connector in the side. But because the inside's female, I had to make a male to male adapter. 
There's also a wire you have to unplug whenever you want to program the controller, so I wired that to a switch. To make the front look better, I made a cover out of that same piece of metal that I made the controller mounts with. I think it turned out really nice. It looks like one continuous controller. Because the frame had a key switch on it, I decided to change the throttle for a better one. After that, we rode the bike around for a while, and it was pretty fun. After riding off-road for a while, the motor gets super hot and it makes a weird stuttering noise, which isn't good. This makes sense because all the power from the battery is going straight into this motor, and it's just like a ball of metal. There's no way to let the heat out. That's why I ordered these hub sinks. They're heat sinks for the hub motor, and they go in between the spokes and help keep the motor cool by dissipating the heat into the air. They also come with some thermal grease to go in between the hub motor and the heat sink to better transfer the heat. However, the hub sinks don't work well by themselves. You have to keep upgrading. For the next step, I need to open the motor. To do that, I took all the bolts out of the sides except for one, which I left a little gap there. And now I'm gonna squeeze it with pliers like this, which will help break the seal and let me pull the cover off. Here's the motor with the cover off. The problem is these coils of copper wire are where all the heat's made and I need it to get out but there's a small air gap in between the magnets and the coils. And air is a really good insulator, so it traps all the heat inside and won't let it escape. That's why you get this, which is called Staterade. It's a magnetic ferrofluid that you can apply in those little gaps and it fills the gap and lets the heat transfer out. After adding the whole syringe, I also added some sealant around the edges before I put it all back together. Now that we didn't have to worry about overheating it, we rode it a lot more. Oh god! It lasted about a month before me and my brothers completely clapped it out. The main joint was so loose that you could feel it when you are riding, and the upper shock mount was so bent that the rear tire would hit the seat. I realized that the joint was loose because the swing arm was riding on top of the threads of the bolt because the bolt was too short. That was a simple fix. I just got a longer bolt so that the swing arm would not touch the threads. I also got a better lock nut. As you can see here, the upper shock mount was super bent, so I needed to fix that. I did that by cutting off the stock shock mount and welding on an adjustable one. The bushings in the shock were also completely destroyed, so I made new ones with some rubber and metal washers. I had also bent the kickstand mount that I welded on, so I just removed it and bolted the kickstand straight to the frame. I also switched to a smaller front chain ring so that the bike would be easier to pedal. After all that, the bike was looking pretty good. When I reinstalled the battery, I also added some straps to hold it in place better because I could tell it was moving from some scratches on the side. Since my battery could do 150 amps, but my controller could only do 100, I decided to modify it for more power. There are two different ways to do this, I decided to do it the easy way. All I did was turn these top two dials counterclockwise all the way, and now the controller outputs way more current. After finally climbing the gravel pile, I noticed the bolts in the rear shock were broken, so I replaced them with solid steel bolts. After that, my brother hit a small jump on the bike, and the front forks and the rear shock both snapped. I guess you get what you pay for when it comes to suspension. In part 2 of this video, I'll be ordering a better shock and forks and showing you guys what this bike can really do. I thought I'd just post this now, since this video is already 7 months in the making and I have other projects I'm working on. Anyways, thanks for watching.